50mm is one of the classic focal lengths because it's so versatile for a fixed focal length prime lens. It can be wide if you're in open space and you back up, or telephoto if you move in closer and use the fancy APS-C Super 35 crop mode that's in high resolution sensors like what's in the Sony a7 IV. Now it's like a 75mm lens. Today we're going to take a look at the Meikai 50mm 1.2 stills lens, which of course I'm going to use for video. It's a premium budget friendly 50 that you might not have heard of. The version I have is for full frame Sony cameras. If you're up for the challenge to go all manual, this lens has a lot of character. I want to show you some examples using the new Sony a7 IV with things I like about the lens and things that I think are maybe some opportunities to explore unmet potential. I'll let you know who I think this lens is for and some of the best use cases for the lens. And I won't even use the word cinematic because, well, my appreciation of cinema goes much deeper than a blurry background. And before we jump in, I want to say welcome if you're new here to Creative Video Tips. I'm Chadwick, and this channel is about crafting stories that make a difference and stand out. I love teaching DaVinci Resolve, and I've been working in post-production with some production for two decades, but I also shoot photos professionally. All that to say, my perspective is coming from a video shooter first. I primarily shoot Blackmagic cameras with Panasonic lenses and Sony cameras with G Master zooms on this channel. I love tech and aesthetics. <laughs> Meikai, they sent this lens over to me for free, which it has no tech at all, but it has some really cool aesthetics with a quasi vintage and creamy shallow depth of field. Depth of field. Apple likes to simplify shallow depth of field to call it portrait mode on the iPhone. Deep depth of field is what you're used to seeing in landscape photography where everything is in focus. It's the area that has acceptable sharpness around a focus plane. You have a distance that's one third in front of the focus plane and two thirds behind. That's the depth of field. The three main things that affect how much is in focus are the camera sensor size, the distance of the camera to the subject, and the aperture, which is what makes this lens so special. It has a huge aperture or hole that creates shallow focus when you keep it wide open. One benefit of shooting wide open is that it makes it simple to separate the subject from the background, like a real busy background, and it cleans up distractions. I think it also looks like abstract art when it gets super blurry. You can create bokeh balls with light sources, and yes, I think the proper way to say it is bokeh, but I like bokeh, so I'm sticking to it, bokeh balls. <laughs> By blurring out the background with a fast aperture like 1.2 or 1.4 in a 50 millimeter, you can direct the viewer's eye to a specific part of the frame. And for me, this is the part of shallow depth of the field that I love the most, being able to direct the attention within the frame of an audience's eye. Another pro tip is to use a lens like this Meikai 50 1.2 to create shots that work great to put on a title graphic of a video or maybe even a YouTube thumbnail. Just find a medium gray or darker region, compose that background so you have negative space for a bright graphic and blur the crap out of it with 1.2. Low light. Another inherent effect of using this 50 millimeter f1.2 lens is that it's fantastic for use in low light environments. It has to do with the logarithmic nature of how light falls off and the physics of how aperture works. This 2.8 G Master right here, this is good at low light, but at 1.2 on this Meikai, that's actually two and a third steps faster. And each stop doubles the amount of light, so we're talking about 2.33 squared, which is actually over five times the amount of light that can hit the sensor. This thing sucks up a lot of light. In practice, that means you can go from needing to shoot at ISO 4000 down to ISO 800. That's going to give you the same exposure with much less noise. It'll be a cleaner image with keeping the shutter speed the same, and since you can't always control how much light you have to work with, it's always great to have a big chunk of good glass handy. Build quality and specs. This lens is all metal. Meikai, they put a red ring around it, which reminds me of Canon L-series glass, but this one's blinged out a bit with some shine. There's no electronics. It's all manual, and it has a very smooth declicked aperture ring, which is nice if you're filming video and you want to smoothly change how bright a shot is. Still, the smooth aperture ring can also be a downside if you need to match to another camera's angle settings because it's hard to tell the exact f-stop that you're parked at. The aperture goes from 1.2 wide open with several marks on the lens, all the way down to f22 for when you want everything on the planet in focus. The closest you can focus this lens is 0.6 meters, which is basically two feet. So you're not going to get big macro shots, but you can always use the APS-C mode on this camera or crop it later in post to bring a unique perspective to objects. If you shoot at f1.2 at this close focus distance, there's only a half inch of depth of field. So regardless, it's going to look abstract and dreamy. The focus ring is also smooth and it rotates around 90 degrees from close focus to infinity. 
As a filmmaker, I would prefer the focus throw to go a little bit further so it takes more rotation to get critical focus. Just a slight movement is a considerable change in the focal plane with this lens. I should note there actually are focus distance markings in both feet and meters on the lens, which are not common to find on autofocus lenses these days. It's very helpful when you want to shoot at a hyperfocal distance for street photography. Now the lens comes with a hood, which might prevent some flares, but I like the use of hoods instead of UV protective filters to protect the lens's front element. There was this one time I accidentally tossed one of my first DSLRs pulling out of the trunk, running to a shoot with a loose strap. It had a 50 millimeter 1.4 lens on it with a hood on it and the camera hit the pavement on the ground after flying 10 feet across a parking lot. And the only damage was some scratches to the lens hood and the battery grip. The lens, it's about 72 millimeters long, which is about the length of a Samsung T7 SSD, and it weighs about 620 grams. Overall, the lens build quality and feel is very premium, and it balances excellent in your hand on a Sony full-frame camera like the Sony a7 IV. All manual lens. Because this is a 100% manual lens, it's gonna force you to learn the exposure triangle of aperture, shutter speed, and ISO, and use the built-in camera's light meter. When shooting photos in manual mode, I generally shoot at around 1 200th of a second shutter speed to freeze most moderate action and eliminate that handheld camera shake. For sports, you should have a faster shutter speed. Then for video, I use the 180 degree shutter rule, so when filming 24 frames per second, I'm using a 1 50th of a second shutter speed. This shutter speed gives smooth motion blur that you're used to seeing in movies. Now one thing to consider if you're filming video outside at 1 50th of a second is that you're going to need to add a neutral density filter to cut down on the light even further when you open that lens up. You could quickly need as many as 10 stops of ND depending on the time of day and weather. Having these set shutter speeds helps simplify things because I'm only balancing aperture for how blurry I want the background against the ISO, which is how sensitive the sensor is to get a proper exposure. A couple of Sony camera settings that are gonna make using an all manual lens a little easier are this. First, since there is no image stabilization inside the lens itself, it's super helpful to use Steady Shot's sensor stabilization that's inside the camera. But the trick is that you need to tell the camera what focal length is attached to work correctly. To manually set this, go to Menu, Shooting Tab, Image Stabilization, Steady Shot Adjust, Manual, and set the focal length to 50 millimeters. The steady shot focal length will show in the main display once you turn it on to either standard or if your camera has it active, which is ideal for video work. One thing that's worth pointing out is there is no Sony Catalyst Browse gyro data for video clips with this lens because there's no electronics. The next features the Sony cameras have will help you perfect your manual focus. You wanna have a button set to do focus magnification to punch into the frame in your viewfinder and then also turn on focus peaking. Focus peaking highlights the sharp edges with a color. I have mine set to red, but you can pick yellow, blue, or white if that works better. And if you choose these two features in combination, I would use focus peaking set to high to really get critical sharp focus with a shallow depth of field. It's not a fast process, but it gives you the perfect detail where you want it. For filming a video with manual focus, a pro tip is to start your video shot with this subject all dialed in, then move the camera away from it. Then in post-production, you can reverse the clip in DaVinci Resolve or your editing app of choice. You might know that a7 IV has a cool new feature for focus breathing composition and also focus map to use instead of focus speaking, but neither of these functions work with all manual lenses like the Meikai 51.2. Sharpness. To test the sharpness of the Meikai 51.2, I took what Mark Rober calls a boring iPad made out of trees, I taped it to the wall, and I shot at all the different f-stops at ISO 100. Therefore, I only changed the f-stop and shutter speed to maintain exposure. I put the camera on a delayed timer on a tripod to get the most accurate results. The sweet spot to get the most detail on most lenses is actually to stop it down, close the hole down two to three stops. Sharpness on any lens is always best in the middle of the frame, so everyone always looks to the corner, so we'll do that. But guess what? I never put my subject in the extreme corner, so I don't care if it's not that sharp out on the edges of the frame. I also couldn't resist doing the same thing on a wall outside to confirm those results with a little bit more distance. Chromatic aberration. Chromatic aberration is when light can't entirely focus on high contrast areas and you end up with colors, usually purple fringes, that didn't exist when you shot the image. 
One type can be fixed really easily in post with a checkbox in Adobe Lightroom. Still, the other, they call it loca. It's longitudinal chromatic aberration. It's trickier to remove because it happens on different planes of focus. The thing to remember is that most folks, they gunk up their images so much with artistic intent. So regardless of how much chromatic aberration a lens has, it's minuscule compared to the Instagram filters that most photographers slap on an image. Flare. This lens certainly does flare, even though it uses some sort of multi-coating, but I view that as the fun part of the character that makes this lens unique. Point it to a bright light or the sun and yeah, it's gonna flare and this is what it looks like. If you don't wanna see the flare, just don't backlight your subject. However, if you want an image with more depth and to look more filmic, notice I didn't say cinematic, always backlight when you have the opportunity. It just looks cooler to see shadows in front to define a shape. Cons. The first thing I had trouble with was letting go of some lens muscle memory because on my Sony lenses, the focus ring right up here is in the same spot that the aperture ring is on the Meikai. So when I think I'm going to grab the focus, I'm actually changing the exposure, which slows me down as I learned that the focus ring is actually closer to me like the zoom ring is on the 16 to 35. The other most significant opportunity to explore unmet potential, <laughs> that's a mouthful, is that I want the throw on the focus ring to change a little bit. I want to turn the focus more for minor adjustments. That way I can nail a focus pull at f1.2. Maybe the cinnamon lenses from Meikai have more distance to travel. And this is really only negative for shooting video. And yes, this was designed as a stills lens. The last couple of cons are pretty minor. There's no weather ceiling, so if your camera's out in bad weather, cover it up. And there's no built-in stabilization to the lens, so make sure you're using it with a camera that has sensor stabilization, like the new Sony a7 IV, or have it on a tripod. Who's it for? I think for video, this can make an excellent lens for filming interviews, but I would stop it down to at least 1.8, maybe even more if your subject moves very much. But I think it's great for anyone that wants a unique, perhaps less clinically correct, sort of retro artistic vibe to the images they create. The image quality is excellent. It's perfect for photography and cinematography students looking for their first menu lens to learn how to control exposure, depth of field, and composition. It's for someone that doesn't mind slowing down a little to craft their images that match their vision. Sometimes automatic features get in the way of our own creativity and this lens takes you back to the basics. So while I wouldn't use this to cover a one-time only event that needs a ton of coverage of moving pieces, I would not hesitate to take this on a photo walk or film some specific B-roll with it. Now it's incredible for the price, which is around $360 in the US. The Sony G Master 1.2 costs more than four times this Meikai lens. And sure, the Sony GM lens is terrific and you generally get what you pay for, but the Sony GM, it might not be in everyone's budget, certainly not in mine right now. Good glass doesn't change or age, and the Meikai will be one of those timeless bits of kit you're gonna be glad you have for those right moments. So even if you don't plan on using this one all the time, it's gonna be a good investment for many years to come. I'm gonna leave a link down below if you wanna learn more, and as always, you can support the channel by starting any shopping spree by using one of those affiliate links. Thank you so much for watching, and stay tuned for more DaVinci Resolve tips coming at you next week. And because there's so much more to learn, I'll see you in that next video.